what would you say is the primary role of the lateral bands of the dorsal apparatus? We talked about these lateral bands being the thickened edge of the dorsal apparatus, but what specifically do they do? Let's take a look more in depth at the lateral bands. The lateral bands are highlighted here in green, and it's a value to note that on the radial aspect, remember this is the left ring finger, on the radial aspect, there is the insertion of the lumbrical muscle that is a linear insertion. It's, it's a very small tendon that is moving up and becoming part of the lateral band. But in addition to that on the radial side is also a portion of this broader interosseous insertion that is a contribution to the lateral band in addition to sharing its insertion with the oblique fibers and the transverse fibers. The same thing is true on the owner side, but on the owner side there is no lumbrical muscle insertion, so the interosseous shares its power with the lateral band on that side as well as oblique and transverse fibers. In other words, only a portion of the interosseous insertion is going directly into the lateral band. The power is shared. I think it's important to note that, however, the lumbrical goes directly into the lateral band and for that reason it has a more direct influence on lateral band tension. Here in looking at the cadaveric specimen, we don't see a distinct um, ropey edge, but we do see a thickened edge of the lateral bands. And we can superimpose on that the lines of force that will be transmitted from the muscles here, the interosseous muscles, two bellies here, and the lumbrical here. The lateral bands, as a reminder, do not traverse in the mid-dorsal location at the PIP joint. They are always somewhat lateral and during flexion they increase their later, lateral and volar position. Here is another cadaver specimen. This is the metacarpal phalangeal joint. This is the PIP joint. And we see clearly the lateral band as it's moving across the PIP joint. Again with the lumbrical insertion and here we actually see that there are multiple insertions of the interosseous muscle, not at all uncommon. I once was teaching a course and the question that was asked was the biomechanics of the insertions of the interosseous muscles at the MP joint. And the person who was asking the question envisioned that this tendinous insertion moved up and down, dorsal and volarly, during MP joint motion, changing thus the influence of this pull because its position would, would then change in relationship to the axis of the joint. I'd like to point out that that is not an accurate way to view this. These insertions are often part of the joint capsule as well. So these insertions do not move freely dorsally and volarly. They have some excursion proximally and distally, but even that is limited because the entire dorsal apparatus is part of the metacarpal phalangeal joint and not separate from it. The lateral bands during finger extension are dorsal to the axis of rotation of the PIP joint. And during finger flexion, those lateral bands have to move both laterally and volarly to allow flexion. You can see here in the upper photograph that the lateral band is well above the axis of the joint. We've exaggerated this a bit, bit to illustrate our point because the amount of movement is not terribly great. But here during finger flexion, the lateral man, band moves volarly. In the normal finger, the lateral band moves 
not only to the axis of the PIP joint, but in absolutely maximum flexion, it moves slightly below it. But it's able to come back up because there's continuity of the dorsal apparatus. It's only in cases of pathology, such as a boutonniere, when there is no continuity of these tissues across here, that the lateral band moves and stays volar to the axis of the PIP joint. Here, another illustration showing the lateral bands, and this is a, a dramatic view of how the lateral bands have to circumvent the mountain of the PIP joint. They must go around, come back together before they insert together. Therefore, any tension in the lateral band is not effective to its maximum at the PIP joint because for maximum extension, the lateral bands would need to be more central at that joint for maximum mechanical efficiency. Here we see surface anatomy demonstrating tension in the extensor digitorum communis. We've looked at this image before. But here we, we talked about how the lateral band is more tense during extension than are the central fibers. And we see here that the lateral band in this individual is indeed carrying the tension to extend both the PIP and DIP joints. It's useful to go back to the concept that none of these fiber groupings move totally independent of the other and therefore they move in concert. So this tension would not be as effective without also having this tension which you may recall the EDC tension tightens up the dorsal apparatus and it thus makes the pull of the small intrinsic muscles more mechanically effective. In other words the intrinsic muscles have less excursion available to them and because of that they would not be able to take up the slack of the dorsal apparatus and have any excursion left to create movement. So the extensor digitorum communis, if you will, takes up the slack and then the smaller excursion and the small contraction of the muscles are able to be effective because it's pulling into an area that already is tight. Here we look how very lateral the lateral bands are. It almost looks like there's a hole between the lateral bands. But look at this redundant tissue here. This is what is necessary to allow full finger flexion, is the redundancy in the mid portion. Otherwise, the finger would not be able to flex. On the radial aspect, the shared contribution of the interosseous and the lumbrical is important to note. The lumbrical has a linear insertion and goes more directly into the lateral band than the interosseous that shares an insertion with other structures. Here is a view, this is the palm, this is the lumbrical muscle coming up distally. Here's the metacarpal phalangeal joint, the PIP joint. So you can see that this lumbrical muscle insertion specifically goes into the lateral band and provides tension to the lateral band. In another part of this series, we'll spend some time specifically looking at the lumbrical muscle and its very important contributions to digital motion.